Well, hi, everybody. It's uh, Friday, February 12th. Isn't this Lincoln's birthday? Hey, wait a minute. Let me get a microphone. All right. Maybe you can hear me better now. Um, yeah, I think it is Lincoln's birthday. We used to celebrate Lincoln's birthday. No, we used to celebrate Washington's birthday, and then we called it President's Day, and then we got, we celebrated two at one time, right? Is that where we are now? I don't know. I I think so. It's been a long time since I've gone to school or had kids in school. Um, today's case is going to be a little bit on the interesting side, maybe a lot on the interesting side. It's probably the type of patient that we've all seen. And then we say, well, what do we do? There's so many barriers in the way of getting to a successful treatment that I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Well, I'm going to tell you that some of you, or you, since each of you watching me individually, are going to disagree with me. Oh, you're not going to like what I have to say at all. In fact, you'll be upset with me on multiple levels. And some of you say, ah, I think I see his point. And others might say, yeah, I get it, you know. And that doesn't mean that I'm right. It means I'm right in my own mind. And maybe it's something that, uh, that we can all learn from because there's going to be some, uh, um, some well, what did I say? I already said controversies, controversies here. So uh, stay with me in the controversies and uh, we'll see how we go. Okay, so let's get to the, uh, let's go to the slides. Okay, so I added to the title because originally it was the anxious one pack a day periodontal nightmare. I figured, hey, why not add gagging to it since gagging is a, a big part of the problem. Hang on, I'm just going to stop the share for a second because I forgot to push a button. There we go. That's going to be better. Okay, good. That should be better for you now. Patient locked in this week. Okay, and all the patients you're seeing now are patients that walked in this week. You know, as we go on in these, I'll be able to show you some treatments that we've done on some of these patients right now. It's here's they are, here's what we did, here's how we gained treatment acceptance, here's that type of thing. So that's what you're gonna see for the all for the next several weeks anyway. As always, we want to uh, uh, thank the Oral Reconstruction Foundation. Uh, that's the education arm of BioRisons for uh, providing continuing education credit, uh, and you're getting your continuing education credit usually on Tuesday, sometimes on Monday. So um, Allison's really fast in getting that out, and we thank Allison for doing that. And some of you are on for the first time. You want to know how to refer others? Go to directorofdentistry.com. And then you click on the bottom here, please sign me up for the free material and you'll get uh, notified. So for those uh, who you're recommending, it's as simple as that. Okay, so let's talk about this patient. So Amy takes the, implant, uh, the intake call. Uh, patient was referred. Yes, we get referrals too. Um, and she wants maxillary SB. <laughs> That's our little brand name for um, for full arch implant supported ceramic prosthesis, meaning solid bite. So, uh, and the doctor will be doing the restorative portion, of course. And she was scheduled on February tenth at um, at three. So it was just what two days ago. So I made the call. She said, in addition to that, she's being referred for replacement of missing posterior teeth. So that's what she told me on the. Uh, on the call. I didn't get much about the anxiousness on this call. Um, so the patient uh, sees the assistant. The uh, patient is here for upper solid bite. Doctor referred her here. Doctor will be doing the restorative. Her last cleaning was two to three years ago. She's very nervous. She smokes a pack a day. And she doesn't want to quit. Okay. I don't know about you, how you feel about implants and smoking. We'll talk about that quite a bit, um, quite a bit today. Okay, so you get the picture. And she's 63 years old. So let's take a look at these pictures a little bit. So there she is. Okay, missing the lateral incisor. I forgot how long she's missing the lateral incisor. Notice the incisal edge of tooth number eight. Um, she's grinding her teeth. 
course, does bruxism have it here, which is significant. What else? Uh, let me go back a slide here. Sorry about that. Um, there were other pictures, but I don't know what happened to them. Maybe, maybe, maybe someplace else. All right, so let's take a look at um, the full mouse series of X-rays. And as you look across, you can get an appreciation. You know, super eruption here. No bone support in number four. There is some bone support in number five. There is some bone support in number six. Number seven. All agreed. No bone support. Okay. Eight. There's some bone support. Nine. There's some bone support. 11, there's some bone support. 12, well, you got a funneling defect in an area where you've got, you know, chances are you've got uh, a, um, a two root of tooth, maybe not so good, but 13, eh, not bad. These x-rays came from the, from the referring dentist, which is fine. And um, she's a gagger, so you can see the difficulty that uh, they had taking x-rays. So let's uh, go through this in more detail. Okay, so now you see the, the x-rays in more detail. And you will see, look for the areas where there is bone support, not the areas that there isn't. <clears throat> you know, we tend to be really, really negative, don't we? I mean, 20 looks awful, doesn't it? 21 looks awful. 22, we get a little bit more. 23, 24, 25, 26, we got a little bit more. I went a little bit fast when I um, went through these x-rays. So I recorded them a little bit too quickly. That's okay, we'll go back. Okay. And what else do you notice? No caries. Huh? Okay, so this is some good news. Okay, there's a little bit of a silver lining. Here's our pocket depth. And I got to tell you that the, some of these pockets, she was feeling everything. I'm not going to probe to the depth of the pocket just to make a point. I don't have to. I know the severity of the periodontal disease. So do you. I want to probe as much as I can probe, but I don't want to torture the patient because we already know why. The patient hasn't been to see a dentist for two or three years. She doesn't like being there. Most don't, but she really doesn't like being there. And the history also is that she's seen a number of different dentists. By the way, the one who referred, referred her to us, that person is the right dentist. That person's really, really good. If you take a look at the mobilities, take a look at the mobilities across, let me just point those out to you. Okay, so there's the mobility right there. No, it's being blocked out by, okay. So two mobility, two mobility, two mobility, three mobility, number four, one mobility, number 11, three mobility and 12, two mobility, one mobility on 14. On the lower, 20 has a three mobility, 21 has a two mobility. Then we've got one, 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 then two on the canine, then one, one, okay? How good is this case? No, it's not very good. I agree with you, it's not very good. Let's look at the CT scan. And again, take a look at where there is bone support. Two and three is super erupted. Four is a disaster. Absolutely. Five has some bone support. Six has some bone support. Seven, not any bone support. Eight does. Nine does. Ten's missing. <clears throat> Eleven does. Bone is nice and wide for dental implants, by the way. Twelve, you can't tell. Thirteen has good bone support. Fourteen, nothing. Fifteen, nothing. And they're super erupted. We're not going to use them anyway. Let's take a look at the lower arch. Okay, so let's look at tooth number 20. Eh, nothing much there. 21, eh, a little bit more. 22, there's bone support there. 23, there's bone support. 24, yeah. 25, yeah. 26, yeah. 27, new two mobility, yeah. 28 and 29, there's some bone support. Okay. Let's go on. And we'll take a look now at the anatomy of design because I want to at least be able to show that in fact we can do dental implants. 
And so if we take a look at the distal most implant, which I've angled to be around the sinus, in order to be able to get some emergence in the first molar area, look at how wide that bone is. That's only a 3.8 millimeter implant. You know, we could put bigger implants in there. Of course, the bigger implants, the 5.0s, aren't as uh, adaptable as the 4.6s, at least in the BioRizon system um, for multi-unit abutments. But 4.6, 3.8, they have great multi-unit abutments, uh, um, same multi-unit abutments that you'll see it uh, with um, um, with Nobel. All right, so let's go through this and you'll start to see the bone support for dental implants. I like that bone support, don't you? Yeah, that's really good. No bone support there. That's not so hot. Bone support's pretty good there, though, on 21. And, you know, if we move this distally, all right, we can move this into the 19 area. How's that bone support? It's pretty good. Probably go farther distal than that. Look at number 30. Decent bone support. Yeah. Let's move it away from that lingual, um, lingual portion of the mandle there. And we can restore that pretty well. So therefore, if we're going to look at this case and do it as a full upper um, uh, ceramic type of um, prosthesis, pretty good. Okay, we all agreed. And on the lower, from a bone standpoint, okay, we can have enough, if we can put enough implants in order to be able to allow us to, to uh, allow her to do it quite nicely. nicely. So there she is. Take a look at the incisal overlap that you see. And by the way, this pus coming out of many of these areas when we're probing. Okay, periodontal disease is pretty, pretty bad as you saw from the periodontal chart. If I were to predict what teeth we can't keep, I think it's a pretty decent prediction, don't you? Okay. Two, we can't keep because it's super erupted. Three, we can't keep because it doesn't have any bone support. It's super erupted. Four, it doesn't have any bone support. Five has some bone support. Six has bone support. Eight has bone support. Nine has bone support. 11 has bone support. 13 has bone support. 20 and 21 are really, really mobile. That's about it. So let's look at force distribution for a second, because remember how mobile the teeth were? So I'm going to point to this, and don't forget, the jaw muscles have the same amount of force. You know, they jaw muscles um, are, are there. You know, we've got our master and our temporalis muscles. <clears throat> when a patient closes down, when a patient bruxes and all that type of thing, there's going to be a lot, there's going to be a lot of force dis distributed over a smaller area. So if we take a look right here, and this is the first tooth that's in, in occlusion on the upper right side, no bone support there, that really isn't an occlusion, it's giving way. And so when the patient bites down, this is the tooth that's taking all the force. Tooth number five and tooth number six. So five and six are essentially supporting the entire right posterior mandible. Is that a reason for those teeth to be mobile? In addition to periodontitis? Of course. If we look at eight and nine, those teeth are mobile too. Bone support is good. We already saw that in the CT scan and the PAs, and we can see this in this, in this panoramic x-ray, which is the panoramic that came from the CT scan. Number 11 has good bone support, and 13 has reasonable bone support. But these two teeth are mobile. Okay, 20 and 21 are mobile. And if 20 and 21 are mobile, what teeth are really taking the, the, taking the force? 11 with 22, nine with 23 and 24, eight with number 25. So essentially the only teeth that are taking force here, because 13 isn't sharing the load at all, because 13 is occluding against a tooth that has no bone support on the bottom here, right? So there's only one, two, three, four, five teeth that are taking the bruxism, the clenching, and those are periodontally involved. Okay, let's look further.
No, let's not let's not look for it. Let's get out of here for a second. Okay. So the patient's not hasn't been with us for or in, in dentistry for two or three years, and I talked to her more. You know, and her, her experiences were bad experiences. Definitely a bad experience with the dental chair. She also was seeing people who were rushing her through something, and where she was you know, where, where she was looking for a solution. And the solution just didn't work. You know, the communication wasn't there. She wasn't convinced that they knew what they were doing. They were a bit abusive to her. And so, and that's what these patients are, particularly, now this happened to be a referral, but as we're going direct to patient, we see a lot of these patients. So the patient goes to somebody who's nice and who's understanding and actually knows how to do their dental work. She did my veneers, by the way, the same dentist. So, um, and she refers over to us. No conversation beforehand refers to us. So I said, we could do solid bite. We could, but you smoke and you said, and, and if we're going to do implants successfully, where well, we can take out the teeth, put the implants in and put a temporary fixed prosthesis on the upper arch all in one day, you gotta stop smoking two weeks before the surgery and four weeks after. If you don't, the chance of failure is pretty high. Okay, put it right out to them. And by the way, if you take a look at uh, some of the um, more recent literature, the failure rate due to um, smoking is eclipsed by the failure rate due to lack of vitamin D. Take a look at Rick Myron, M-I-R-O-N. Take a look at his work. And uh, he's, he summarized that he wrote a book with Mike Picos last year. Um, you'll see that chart in, in his book. I'm sure it's quoted in the literature. And you'll see that um, I think the failure due to smoking was something like 6%. Failure rate due to vitamin D deficiency was 11%. Finding a lot of ways, reasons to take vitamin D right, right now, aren't we? Okay, vitamin D associated with the reduction in length of time of COVID, reduction in severity of symptoms of COVID if you take vitamin D. Blood levels of vitamin D are a big deal right now. Yeah, I know we're looking at zinc and ivermectin has now at least come off the you can't do it list, something well, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, although this certainly. Plenty of evidence to show that ivermectin works for COVID. Um, but, you know, we understand that there's some politics associated with, uh, with the prescription. I, I talked to my doctor. Right? I said, can I have some hydroxychloroquine? You know, and of course, we got a discussion as to whether it works or not. And she said, even if I want to do it, I can't do it. Because if I prescribe hydroxychloroquine, I'm put on a list. You know, it's like you're being put on a narcotics list. So doctors can't even prescribe what they want to anymore. That's how, how the climate is charged right now. But ivermectin, you, ivermectin, if you're looking for a preventive and, you know, at least it's something where you can go to your doctor. If your doctor um, agrees that it may be a good idea, at least you can get that prescription written for you now. All right, let's go okay, far afield. Let's get back. Um, but there is reasonably good evidence that shows that vitamin D is associated with dental implant failure. Okay, so every one of our patients begins vitamin D, 5,000 international units, 30 days before any surgical procedure. Okay, an emergency dental procedure, we can't do it, but most surgeries are booked out four weeks, so uh, it's pretty easy to do it. Okay, vitamin D3. So, um, and that comes from Rick Meyer. But you've got a patient now who's a gagger. And I'm saying, you've got to stop smoking two weeks beforehand and four weeks afterwards. And she said, she can't do it. She said, I said, have you ever tried? She said, yeah, I tried twice. I was able to do it for three weeks and that was it. So my response says, that's fine. Okay, we, we, we can look at that and we can work with that, but understand that if we take the teeth out and put implants in, we can put implants in on the same day, at least I'm willing to. But I wouldn't load the implants on that day. You know, I'm, I'm reluctant to go all the way through, particularly in a, in, in a case which is an aggressive periodontitis. I'm reluctant to do that. You know, 
I'll carry it part way, but I won't carry it all the way. I don't want an open wound, an open wound where um, there is a prosthesis attached to an implant that, that I place. Now we can talk about the fact that we'd be able to do alveolectomy and eliminate those areas. Physically, we can't. Bacterially, we can't. Okay, so um, that's why you'll see how we've developed the approach that we've taken. But let's assume that the patient says, oh, there's no way on earth I'm gonna, I can wear a denture. Can't, I'm a gagger can't do that. You're not willing to do the surgery. I'm not willing to stop smoking. I can't wear a denture. What am I going to do? Particularly when you just told me that you're going to put the implants in for four months before you're even going to start to restore them. And it might be four or even six months afterwards. I'll be without teeth for 10 months. I can't do that either. So let's go back if you can to what we remembered here. And let me go back. Let me just see if I can go back to the PowerPoint. All right, so let's go backwards a little bit. Oops, sorry. All right, so let's go back. Let's go back to this picture here. Okay, and I'll just leave it here. Hopefully you can see it in this form so I can kind of scroll through. The patient has an aggressive periodontitis, even on the teeth that I say have good bone support. We'd never restore these teeth this way with the pockets that were present, with the mobility that's present. If the patient can't isn't willing to stop, are we willing to use these teeth to support a fixed prosthesis? So use number five, six, eight, nine, 11, and 13 for a fixed prosthesis. And the answer is, I don't know. I don't know whether I'm ready to do that yet. But we've got to at least help the patient along and make some help the patient make and make a decision. And she has an aggressive pussy type of uh, periodontitis in the presence of smoking. Okay, oral hygiene wasn't bad in the presence of smoking. Calculus wasn't bad. The dentist and I, the general dentist and I are agreed that we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're going to be able to save most of the lower teeth. Okay, so those teeth are going to be saved. Okay, so we're going to save 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, and 28. We're not going to save number 20. We know that. 21, maybe, but I doubt it. Particularly if we're doing implants on that side, I don't know that we're going to save number, number 21. So now you're a periodontist, okay? Even the general dentist here, you're a periodontist. What do you do? What do you do? How do you work with this patient? And the first thing I want to know, first thing I want to know is what bacteria is growing there. I have a microscope and so I can uh, take a, a little sample, put it under the microscope, but I can't diagnose from that. I know there's some who say they can, but that's okay. I'm glad they can. I can. Okay. I can find some things. I can see some bugs swimming around. I can find some amoeba every once in a while. I can find something that's of interest and that's of interest to the patient. And that's good, okay? We want something of interest. We want the patient to be able to communicate with us. We want the patient to be able to see what we're seeing. And we know that we can keep number 22 through 29, 29, 28, whatever that was. We know that we can keep that. We know that we can keep that, but we've got to get that periodontitis under control. By the way, I forgot to tell you, she'd been to an orthodontist a few years ago. <clears throat> and the orthodontist said, I can't move these teeth. There's not enough bone support. She hadn't been to a periodontist, by the way. So, and good for the orthodontist. And the orthodontist is a good orthodontist, by the way. I haven't been in contact with that orthodontist about this case, but who knows, we might. What if we did this? We're going to run a neural DNA test, which those of you who have been on these, the, these uh, webinars know that I feel is a great test. It's a test that nobody's doing or very few are doing. 
spit in the cup, send out the saliva sample out to the lab, find out from the lab what bacteria is growing there. And I know what antibiotic is going to be helpful to control or to control the bacteria that's invaded into the soft tissue. I can't control this case by root planing perioscopy. I don't care how good my hygienists are. My, I have my hygienists are the best. Um, I need an antibiotic assist. And I sure want to know what antibiotic we need to assist in the perioscopy procedure because we know we're saving the lower teeth. How about if we do this? How about if we run the oral DNA test? Find out what bacteria is growing there, prescribe the antibiotic, and do the perioscopy on the lower teeth only. Okay? Wait six weeks and then go back and do a reevaluation. In fact, right after the perioscopy, we could see her for reevaluation as well, because what's happened? We've used an antibiotic. Is that antibiotic just going to go to the lower teeth? No, the antibiotic is going to go here too. I know you say antibiotics don't, don't cure periodontal disease, and they don't, but they sure do give us an indicator, uh, an indication of control or what can happen when the invasive bacteria are killed and we can see a healing response. So I say to her this, I say, listen, I'm not sure about the upper arch. We've already talked about what you can do and what you're willing to do and you can't stop smoking. And I don't feel comfortable extracting these teeth and giving you a solid bite prosthesis, a temperate solid bite prosthesis all at one time. I don't feel comfortable with that either because I'm afraid the implant's gonna fail. What if we do this? We'll prescribe the oral DNA test. We'll prescribe the antibiotics. We'll go ahead and we'll replane the lower arch only. And then we'll go back and we'll do a full reevaluation on the upper and the lower arch. I don't want to waste your money on the upper arch if I don't think we can treat it. But if we can treat it and if we find these improve, maybe these will improve enough that we won't have to extract all the teeth and we can use some of these natural teeth to support a fixed bridge. How do you feel about that? And then we can go to the braces if, if you want in the orthodontic treatment in order to be able to straighten them out <clears throat> before we do the bridge work. She said, I like that idea. We can go on baby steps. And I like the idea of baby, baby steps. And she and I came to an agreement. The most important part of this is not the oral DNA test. The most important part of this is we came to an agreement and I told her, I don't want to waste your money. We know we need to do this treatment here anyway. We can always evaluate this later on afterwards and decide whether it's worthwhile doing treatment on the teeth that we can think we can save on the upper arch. And of course, I'm going to be working with the general dentist the entire time. And I compliment the general dentist. And I tell her, that general dentist did my veneers. Okay, so we're working hand in hand. And of course, I want to communicate with the general dentist as well. Uh, even at that time, to make sure the general dentist uh, agrees. But the logic statements are there. Now, what will happen? This patient has not had confidence in a dentist in years. She finally went to a dentist that she had confidence in who referred her to me and refers her to you. You're an extension of that general dentist. That's neat. And that's, that's one reason why we maintain referral relationships. I know you know, I'm direct to practice. I know. And, you know, we've talked about that before and you've, you've read what I've written, all that type of stuff. But we've got that relationship. You have caught in the clearinghouse, gone through the clearinghouse and the general dentist has recommended you. And now you're taking baby steps. Now, what could happen? One thing that could happen is now that she's established a relationship and now that we're going to do some intravenous sedation in order to be able to allow us to do some uh, good perioscopy in the lower arch, good root planing, and get that done and get a result, now we have a patient who's gone through treatment and has started to experience an office where she starts to become more comfortable. This is a relationship exercise. In fact, every one of our patients is a relationship exercise. We're here to build relationships with patients. We're not there to fix teeth. Teeth is the ancillary part of it. 
It's the relationship we're building. And the fact that she and I can come to an agreement in a half an hour makes it even better. We could come to an agreement and she understands where I'm headed and I understand what she's willing to do and what she isn't willing to do. Now, what could happen in those six weeks? Probably two, take two or three weeks for her to get in for us to begin the perioscopy treatment. But then again, the oral DNA test is going to take, take about a week, 10 days for us to get the results back. Then we'll prescribe the antibiotic. <coughs> Excuse me. And we'll prescribe the antibiotic um, the day before treatment. Okay, for those of you who haven't been on before. We don't do antibiotics any earlier than one day before perioscopy treatment. Why? Because the tissue tightens up so much, you can't get down and instrument the pocket. You can't instrument through. So particularly in a case like this, particularly in an aggressive case. Sorry, hopefully the cough drop will be done. Um, so during that time, she may start thinking, well, can I stop smoking or not? I may look at her and I'll say, well, gee, these lesions have really quieted down on the, uh, on the upper just with antibiotics. Maybe I'm more, more willing to extract the teeth, put implants in, put a prosthesis in all at the same time, temporary prosthesis, which the general dentist is going to do. If you're, and maybe she's willing to confront stopping smoking see what happened to that first visit. You know, if you go to the dental implant place, what are they going to do? They're going to extract the teeth, they're going to put in the implants in and put in whatever's going to put in. And you know darn well, these patients are subject to what? To peri-implantitis. I'm trying to reduce peri-implantitis. So I've got to take a stepwise approach. And if we want to talk about how we're different as comprehensive dentists, it is that we don't do this and do this and shove that in. Some patients we may, but we don't do it in everybody. That we're giving a thoughtful, step-by-step -step approach to a patient that the patient can live with. We should all be able to do what the dental implant outfits do. Okay, no question about that. You should be able to do that. That should be in your toolbox. It's in our toolbox. Um, in order to be able to attract these patients, be able to do everything that they need. But then there are the steps that we can take as periodontists that will never be approached by anybody else. And for those general dentists here, you find a periodontist you can work with in this case. Make sure the peri you and the periodontist are on the same page. Okay, it's, it's as important as that, okay, that not it's not just our surgical skills, it's our relationship building skills and our thinking skills. And imagine sending a saliva sample out to a laboratory and identifying the bacteria. Well, that makes sense. That happens in medicine. Why wouldn't it happen in dentistry? Well, it can't. And it costs $99 for the test and nobody refuses to pay that $99. Because we're identifying the bacteria and it makes sense to them. Let's go back. Okay, so let's go to the letter that I wrote to the I wrote to the dentist. Okay, dear doctor, patient presents for evaluation. Clinical findings consist with diagnosis of severe and aggressive periodontitis. She has, as you know, severe periodontitis of both the upper and lower arches. She was treated by a general dentist at one time. There's been no treatment in the past several years for periodontal disease. She was treated by a general dentist for periodontal disease at one time but nothing in the past several years. She's lost a great deal of bone and certainly is likely the number four, number seven will be lost, but there are other teeth that can possibly be saved. Patient is a smoker. She cannot stop smoking. And therefore, if we were to go to an implant solution on the upper arch, there would need to be a delay between extractions and dental implant placement. The patient would have to wear an upper denture and she's a gagger. She also has sleep apnea. I forgot about that. She has sleep apnea and she, was, and she was using her teeth for the sleep apnea appliance at one time. She had teeth that could withstand that stress. And she was treated with an intraoral appliance at one time. I've told her that you can help her with sleep apnea after completion of treatment. This dentist is really good at treating, treating, with sleep, treating sleep apnea. I'm making an alternative proposal to doing the implant supported prosthesis in the upper arch, although we may still end up doing it. 
And by the way, I'm dictating this right in front of the patient so she can hear me dictating to her doctor. Okay, I'm dictating. It's going to go to our transcriptionist who happens to be my daughter. She's going to type it out. But the patient's hearing me say this. I'm telling the story. How important is it to tell the story? And now we're telling the story in front of the patient. We're writing this letter. Some of you aren't comfortable with that. I wasn't either. I also wasn't comfortable doing public speaking like I've been doing for the past many years. I, I wasn't a public speaker to start, but the more we practice, the better we get at it. Okay. Same thing, dictating in front of the patient. Patient is hearing you talk about her to the general dentist. And by the way, she can verify whether in fact you're correct or not. I don't want this patient to spend any more money here than she has to. Tell me, isn't that music to the patient's ears? And what I would like to do is treat the periodontal disease in the lower arch first and see if her upper arch comes around as a result of the antibiotics that we prescribe for the periodontal disease on the lower. If it does, then it may be worth, no, it's not the periodontal disease in the lower, of course, the periodontal disease all over the mouth. If it does, then it may be worthwhile to save some of the teeth on the upper arch, do orthodontic treatment on the upper arch and the lower arch, and do crown and bridge rather than go to an implant supported prosthesis. So we do it that way, she wouldn't have to wear a denture. However, I have to be confident that in fact, this is going to work. And therefore we would treat the lower arch first. I will do a reevaluation of the lower arch and the upper arch and see if it is worthwhile doing the periodontal treatment on the upper arch or not. Therefore the sequence is the following, oral DNA test. Number two, prescription of appropriate antibiotic in conjunction with perioscopy in the lower arch. Number three, perioscopy in the lower arch. Note, I think number 20 is going to be lost no matter what. I didn't even say number 21 is going to be lost, although I think so. I think 21 has so little bone support that we may not want it. We might rather put an implant there, but right, right now we're saying 20. <clears throat> reevaluation six weeks later, as we do the reevaluation, I'm going to uh, probe both the upper arch and the lower arch. If I, if I see improvement in the pockets, and the patient says it feels better when I probe on the upper arch, then we may go for periodontal treatment on the upper arch in lieu of extractions. If not, then we'll proceed with the solid bite procedure, but it will have to be a staged procedure given the smoking. If we go with conventional crown and bridge, then the patient has already seen Dr. Orthodontist for orthodontic evaluation. She can see Dr. Orthodontist to straighten the teeth prior to the final prosthodontics. I will leave that decision up to you after I give you a better assessment as to how much periodontal disease control we have achieved. If we have to go with implants in the upper arch, then she does have a great deal of bone and certainly more than sufficient bone for placement of implants. Finally, if we are able to successfully treat the periodontal disease in the lower arch, then one implant on the lower right posterior, one implant on the lower left, and I changed my mind to two, but okay, uh, may be desirable to take the stress off the weaker teeth in the posterior. Okay, actually off the weaker teeth in the anterior. We've uploaded the CT scan for your review. Thank you for your confidence referral. So let's go back a second. So now we look at these teeth. Could we do, now understand, from a prosthodontic standpoint, we would be, let's assume we keep these teeth for a moment. I'm not saying we are, but if she responds to periodontal treatment, then if we keep five, six, eight, nine, 11, and 13, then we could do a full arch prosthesis from five to 13. We could open the bite within that prosthesis so we don't have as large an incisal overlap as we did before. So we're opening the bite two millimeters and providing lingual platforms on the upper prosthesis for the lower teeth to hit. And we end up with only a 10% uh, overbite rather than a 40% overbite takes less stress takes the stress off of these teeth. That's how we do the prosthesis. And then there's plenty of bone by the time these teeth are extracted to put implants in numbers three and four area if we decide to, put an implant in the number 30 area if we decide to. Yeah, let me get, let's get to a pointer here. Okay, so implant 30 area and put an implant here in the 29 area, in the 21 area, and perhaps an implant in the number 19 area, because I don't want to be involved with all of this lack of bone support in order to be able to support a uh, 300 fixed bridge is going to go from 19 through 21, single crown here. By the way, if this tooth were half decent and the bone were half decent, because right, it's the worst bone she's got, 
I very often will put a, a an implant at number 20 and make it into a molar, save the patient the money, make that 20 look like a first molar rather than a second bicuspid. And maybe we don't have to do two implants there. Okay. That's the idea. And if not, we have plenty for a solid bite. And now we have to see whether, you know, if the infection is really under control and she's willing to stop smoking, it may be cheaper and easier to go to solid bite. But then the patient has some time to kind of get used to the idea that maybe I can stop smoking. Maybe I will do it because it's worth it to me because I'm a gagger and I know what it's like to be a gagger. And I don't want to gag with dentures and I'm not willing to do that. So she's going to have eight weeks to think about this. And then she and I have established a relationship. We've come to some agreements. We may come to some more agreements. And there may be something like a what if. What if this happens? What if that happens? And then we can get into a conversation. And my assistants are trained that way as well in order to be able to provide an answer for that patient. This works with, this has worked with countless patients in our office. Countless patients. I want to show you a little bit of an add-on, something else. Okay, so let's take a look at this. And that's the final. Now, I, I've been using imaging for a long time. I just bought this imaging program. I practiced on her yesterday. And I sent her an email and I said, and she said, I like that a lot better. <laughs> I said, can I use you for the, uh, for the lecture I'm giving today? She said, yeah, uh, just tell them I, look, I used to look a lot better. <laughs> I said, we've got a great raw, raw material to work with. Um, and I know you look good <laughs> at one time. We're going to get back there again. Imaging is something the periodontists can do. After all, people don't care about gums. They care about teeth, don't they? They care about what they're going to get, what they're going to end up with. And if what they're going to end up with is going to be really, really cool and is going to look like that, um, then they'll let you take all the steps. They understand the steps, and here's the goal. Uh, uh, imaging program, by the way, is Envision, E-N-V-I-S-I-O-N. -I -I it's around $4,000 and uh, for a case like this, I'm going to use it for everybody, but use it for uh, people that you want to uh, decide uh, on, uh, on, on treatment. Um, and they need an idea as to what it's going to look like. You can, get you can get really good with this really fast. Now, I just got this one. We were using another program in the past. Um, and so, uh, and I, I do PowerPoint. Um, a lot. So I, I was able to, to get it, but you know, it might take 10 or 15 minutes for you to get it. Um, or you can even ask Envision to, uh, uh, to do it for you. You can just mail, email them the JPEG and they'll, uh, they'll do it and they'll, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll give it back to you so you can see it in a second visit. Okay. So um, that's, that's our patient. Anybody have any questions, any comments, anything that is um, going on? Now I got a question for you. My, usually I go to bed really early. <laughs> but um, I've got a question for you. And uh, if you can comment in the, uh, the Q&A, because I don't have a chat thing here. If we went to evenings, then we put the, put, did these at, let's say, 8 p.m. And I'll take a nap beforehand. Um, did this at 8 p.m. on a Thursday night. Would that be better for you? By the way, on March 18th, we're going to be doing one at 9 p.m. Eastern time, 8 p.m. I'm, I'm supposing 8 p.m. The reason on March 18th, we're doing one 9, 9 p.m. Eastern time that I'm actually um, lecturing for a study club uh, for one of our clients. So, um, and you'll all be invited to that. So there, that'll be uh, good, 6 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, this first time happens to be in California and uh, there's doctors in California and, uh, um, and it'll be uh, 9 p.m. Uh, here. But I'm toying with the idea. Just let me know how you feel about evenings. I'm getting some answers right now. Fridays are better for me. Anytime would be great. Great, great strategy. Thanks for sharing. 5 p.m. specific time. I'm still working. Oh, come on. <laughs> I can't stay up at nine o'clock. I'm not nearly as excited. Maybe you don't want me to be excited. Any other comments? All right. Well, email me. Let me know. In the meantime, I will see you again 
uh, next Friday at this time at 12 noon Eastern, uh, 9 a.m. Pacific. Thanks for joining us and uh, see you next week. Have a great week. Bye-bye.